الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وبعد I think after the, the long break we have to uh, we have to review a little bit what we're doing uh, after we had a break for final exams and then we had a break for my head trip so we're <coughs> inshallah back to finish this uh, series and we're talking about the uh, the sources of tafsir in other words when someone wants to make tafsir what are the sources they have to look to and so far we've covered uh, how many have we covered so far? Well, this matter, <laughs> the, the sources we discussed so far first was the Quran and then the uh, Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then what did we do next? The Arabic language? Yeah. No, Sahaba. Fine. Statements of the Sahaba next. But we also discussed the statements of the Tabi'een whether or not they are Hujjah or not. Uh, whether or not they are a proof in, in Tashir and it's something you have to accept. And the Arabic language, principles of the Arabic <coughs> language. And then the last topic we were discussing was Asbab al Nuzul. Well, I hope, inshallah, we defined Asbab al Nuzul uh, last time. What we're talking about when we, when we talk about Asbab al Nuzul is that some verses were revealed with respect to certain incidents or certain things that happened during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. And the, the Asbab al Nuzul, or these incidents, uh, or these occasions, or these causes of the revelation, they give us some idea about the exact meaning of, of the verse itself. And we gave some examples. Last time we talked about the importance of Asbab al Nuzul. And we gave some examples of what are some of the uh, any devastating conclusions you can come to if you do not take into consideration the Asbab al Nuzul. For example, one of them we said that if you do not look to Asbab al Nuzul when making tafsir, one conclusion you can have is that alcohol and khanzir and everything is halal. Based on what verse? For example, in that case, there's a, there's a verse uh, that we talked about last time that says, There shall be no sin upon those who believe and do good works for what they may have eaten. And the verse makes it clear that no matter what they have eaten, there's no uh, sin upon them. So, in fact, one of the Sahabi he understood that verse. He said, I am one of those people who have iman and do amal salih, do the good deeds, and, and, uh, and have the. Uh, and taqwa and so forth he said I am one of those people who whatever I eat it's not sit, no sin upon me, upon me. so the, the the fundamental mistake that he made is that he did not take into consideration what that verse was referring to it was referring to something specific what was it referring to? the verse was referring to after alcohol was made haram some of the sahaba they worried about those people who had died before alcohol was made haram and they used to drink alcohol so they asked, yani, what is the case of those people who, who used to drink alcohol and they died yani, before alcohol was prohibited. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse saying that there is no sin upon them. And we give other examples. Yani, for example, uh, uh, if you don't take into consideration this Bab al then you can pray in any direction you want. You don't have to face the, the Kaaba necessarily. When it comes to Hajj, you don't have to go between uh, the mountains of uh, Sopa and Marwa and so forth. <coughs> These are some of the things that we covered uh, last time, two months ago. <laughs> well, we also talked about how to dis- determine Asbab Nuzul, that it has to be uh, Naqli, in other words, it has to be something narrated from the time of the Prophet Muhammad It cannot be something Aqli, in other words, you cannot just uh, read a verse in the Quran and say, oh, this verse must have been revealed because of this and this or during this time. Now, you have to, I need a proof for it, has to be something uh, naqli or something narrated in Taban. Uh, obviously, the narration has to be uh, authentic. And we, can, we covered some other topics uh, related to Asbab al For example, there could be more than one cause or one incident that led to a revelation of a specific verse, or one uh, cause may lead to more than one verse being revealed. We discussed this uh, last time. So the point that we came to, I think, by the way, this is according to my notes, <laughs> and I'm sure none of you will remember well enough to, to tell me if I'm right or wrong, but I think this is where we left off last time. <laughs> that is that when you take a verse, and you know the asbab and nuzura of the verse, and you look at the, the verse itself, the question is how is that verse to be applied? Is it to be applied according to the general meaning of the verse, 
Or does it only apply to the specific case that it was revealed concerning and not to anything else? We didn't discuss this. Yeah, this is where, from where we left off. So, everyone understand the uh, question? Yeah, that if there's a verse that was revealed for a specific occasion, does the ruling just apply to that occasion and not in general? Or is, it, is the ruling independent of the occasion and applies to anything else? Any, uh, any thoughts on that? So the, the famous statement, <coughs> which uh, I alluded to, and Ebra, this is a very difficult, by the way, statement to translate tra- tra- into English. I'll ask you to do it when I'm done. <laughs> the Ebra, the Amun, and Lot, la di khusur sasabat. Or the, I mean, the ruling is based on the generality of the uh, of the text and not the particular uh, occasion. So this is this is the principle that you will hear a lot, and many people will quote this principle. The question is: Is this principle something agreed upon by all the scholars, and does it apply to all the cases? That's the question that we have to discuss. So. If we look at the verse in the Quran in which there's Asbab and Nazul, we can break them down into four cases. I think four cases. So the first case is where the the Asbab or the reason the reason behind the verse is something general, and the wording of the text itself of the of the Quranic verse is also general. Okay, so here we have the reasoning. The reason is general. And the wording is general. In this case, there's no problem. All the scholars are agreed that this applies to every other case in general. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 222, Yes, al-Mahib, Qul huwa adha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this verse says, They question you concerning menstruation, say it is an illness. فَأَتَزِلُوا النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيبِ وَلَا تَقْرِبُهُنَّ حَتَّى يَتْخُنْ So for this verse says that the question concerning menstruation say it is an illness as they translate it usually in English So let women alone at such times and go not into them until they are cleansed Okay, what's the Asbab and of that verse? What was the occasion that led to the revelation of that verse? Okay, very good, yeah, obviously Someone asked It's clear from the verse that someone asked and uh, the, the occasion <coughs> behind the revelation of that verse is that during that time among the Jews when a woman would menstruate and have her period they would remove her from the house and she would not sleep in the same house and they would not eat with her they would not touch her and they would not be together with them in the house so the Muslims asked the Prophet Muhammad him about what is the Islamic uh, view of that or we could say actually what is the correct view of that so when they asked him about how women should be treated during the menstruation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse so the asbab and nuzul is general in other words they asked him a general question what about menstruating women well the text also is general that they are asked about menstruation say it is an illness do not approach women so the Prophet said him explain the meaning of the verse that you can do anything with them except have uh, sexual intercourse and in other words in Islam when the woman is menstruating you don't put her out of the house you can sit with her you can eat with her you can talk with her and so forth in fact you can do anything with her except have uh, sexual intercourse so here the the wording is general and this bab or the cause is general so it applies to uh, all cases without any problem sometimes the reason or the reference in the text is specific and also the wording of the text in the Quran is specific so the asbab is something specific or the reference is something specific and also the wording of the text is specific in this case is it the case that uh, and it is implied, applied in general or not okay. in this case the, the text or the verse is not applied in general but it keeps its specific meaning <coughs> well, who can give an example of that? Which one? About menstruation? 
کچھ چیزوں کو دینا چاہیے دس ویس از فرام سورت میل دا ٹرانسلیشن اینڈ دس از دی ورڈ بائی دا وے اٹس ٹرانسلیٹ سم تھنگ آف دس نیچر فار ریموو فرام اٹ ول بی دا رائٹس ہو گیو ہز ورک دیٹ ہی مے گرو ان گڈنس اینڈ نائن ہیز ود ہم اینی فیور فار ریوارڈ ایکسپٹ ایز سیکنگ ٹو فلفل دا پرپس آف ہز گیورڈ موسٹ ہائی ہی ورلی ول بی کنٹینٹ سورا نائنٹی ٹو specific. الأتقى which is فعل تفضيل in this case usually العموم if it's with al it is usually general but not in this case because it doesn't meet the other conditions of being عام here it is specific here الأتقى according to the مفسرين it means Abu Bakr and it means only means Abu Bakr it's not in general any, any, any. it's not in general this, these particular verses are not to be taken in general but they are revealed with a specific reference and they are stated in a specific way and the principle of the Seer is that they remain specific. That's the second case. Specific uh, reference and specific wording. Okay. What if the, uh, the third case is if the reason or the bad is specific And the wording of the verse is general. So the spread is specific, but the wording of the verse is general. But, at the same time, there is some external proof to show that the ruling only applies to that particular case. So here it's obvious. These three cases, by the way, the first three cases we're discussing, there's no difference among the scholars. All of them agree on these things. But, for example, in this case, if the reason is specific and the wording is general, but there's some... Uh, external evidence to show that it's not a general ruling then obviously it is a specific ruling okay. for example in uh, Surah An-Nur uh, verses 23 through 25 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna al-ladheena yarmoon al-muhsinati bil-ghafilati al-mu'minati lu'inu fi al-dunya wal-akhirah al-ayah uh, Allah was for those who slander virtuous believing women who are naive, cursed are they in the world and the hereafter, theirs will be an awful doom, and so forth, yeah, to the end of uh, verse 25. For this verse, the wording is what? General or specific? General. Okay, the wording is general. The isbab is what? Specific. Okay, the isbab is referring to the, the story of Ifq, or those people who, uh, and it said, false uh, accusations about the wife of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Aisha Faith Is the ruling general or is it specific here? Well I already told you the answer to that I said we're in case 3 yeah. Why is the ruling specific? Well, Since you Nice Okay. The difference between them is that if you go to the beginning of uh, Surah Al-Nur, verses 4 and 5, it talks about وَالَّذِينِ يَرْمُونَ الْمَحْسِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِأَرْبَةِ شُهَدَاءِ And it talks about the punishment for them, which is, as we said, uh, 80... Uh, in English, 80... Uh, flash back. Hey. So, verses 4 and 5 of Surah Al-Nur, says that the punishment is 80 uh, lashes for the one who uh, accuses an innocent woman of adultery. But also that verse continues to say that if they repent, if they repent, then Allah will accept their repentance. So uh, the Sahabi Ibn Abbas explained these two verses 
He said the first verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Du'ina fi dunya wal akhira. And in this case, there's no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept repentance. That's only referring to the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa While the other verses, verses 4 and 5, this is referring to the general case. So the first case where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about no, uh, or mentions no kind of repentance that will be accepted from them, this is only talking about making qadr or accusing the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of adultery. While the second set of verses is a more general one, uh, as applies in, in any case other than the wives of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is that clear? Those first three cases are clear? So the fourth case is if the cause is something particular, but the wording of the text is general. What should be done in that case? The cause is particular, and, but the wording is general. What should be done in that case? Could, uh, shed some light. Let me ask you more. <laughs> should it be considered gen- should it be considered general based on its wording, or should it be considered particular based on the particular uh, cause? So you cannot give me an answer. <laughs> Again, it may be both. No one you. <laughs> that sounds <clears throat> on this question, there's different opinion among the scholars. So this is the question which you would use that phrase if we talk about that and in Abrabil Amum al this is where that phrase would come into play. There is a different opinion on this question. Right? The first, the first opinion, the opinion of the majority of the scholars, and probably and clearly the uh, the stronger opinion is that, and as that phrase says, that you take the general wording of the text and you apply it in general, regardless of the specific uh, cause. For example, we talked earlier, two months earlier, <laughs> about al-li'an. What is first of all al-li'an? Because some uh, is, uh, is in the case of the, of the when the man accuses his wife of adultery. By the way, li'an is only in that case when the man accuses his wife of committing adultery. And also the wife. Some la, la. <laughs> some American Muslims they apply it also the other way when the wife accuses the man of adultery. This is not plan. You don't apply the same principles in that case. And it was, as we talked about, it was revealed with respect to specific incidents. Yeah, only one way. Only when the man accuses his wife. Not the one the woman. No. <coughs> it, was, it was revealed, uh, that, was one, that was an example that we gave of one verse and two different uh, causes. It was revealed with respect to two different uh, Sahabi. Sahaba, but any the the wording of the text is general, so it applies to anyone also in their circumstance. So if anyone comes today and accuses his wife of adultery and cannot produce four witnesses, then he has to make li'an. Or, if he doesn't make li'an, what? He gets 80 lashes. If I remember the... And the argument for this group, uh, which is, as I said, majority... Uh, uh, the majority opinion is that number one the wording of the sharia itself yani the nusus the wording of the sharia itself is the proof or authority in Islamic law in other words the texts of the Quran and the sunnah are hujjah in Islamic law and they are not uh, conditioned by their surrounding question or cause secondly the normal case is to apply any term in its general ru- ruling unless there is some specific evidence to Specify. In other words, if, if the Prophet وسلم, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran mentions anything in a general form, then the basic ruling is you apply it in general unless there's some evidence to not to apply it in general. And thirdly, this was the practice of the Sahaba and the Sabaheen, or the companions and the, the following generation. And in fact, this was the opinion of all of the Sahaba. There's no uh, reported. Um, there's no report that any of them disagreed with this uh, with this opinion that if something is mentioned in general I mean in a general way and in a general fashion then it applies to everyone that falls on, under it regardless of whether the the uh, suburb or the cause was uh, specific or not this is the opinion as I said of the majority of scholars including 
the majority of the Shafi'i is few people <laughs> the majority of the Hanbalis the majority of the Hanafis we don't have uh, any Hanafi here right now the majority of the Maliki Uthman okay and also the majority of the scholars of Usul al in general some people claim that this was not the opinion of Imam Shafi but they are not correct in that in that thing I said Hanbali point two the, the representatives here. <laughs> but the opinion of the minority, okay, or the other opinion on this, uh, the other opinion <coughs> states that the wording does not cause generality. But, now as we'll see, the difference between them is kind of slight. They said the wording by itself, the, the opinion of the first group is automatically, because of the wording of the text, it applies to everyone who falls under that same circumstance. <coughs> the opinion of the, of, the minor, of the minority of the second group is that automatically it doesn't apply to anyone else except through the yes or analogy. Okay. Now, uh, and basic, their basic argument is that if uh, if the asbab isn't needed, we don't need to know the asbab, then there's no reason to mention it in the first place. That's their basic argument. Well, the Ghazali in his book on the Sul Fiqh, he refuted them. I will not go into their his, uh, reputation. It's kind of... Uh, there are some tricky arguments involved there. Uh, this is this second opinion, as I said, is the minority opinion. It was held by uh, Abu Thaw, for example, al Qafal, Al-Mazni. And it has also been narrated from Imam Malik and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Now my question to you is, is there in fact any difference of opinion, any difference between these two opinions? Or is it basically just a matter of wording? Again, the first group says that the text automatically applies to anyone else who also fits the meaning of the text. Well, the second group says no. It refers just to the person it was re- revealed concerning, and we apply it to other people only on the basis of chaos or analogy. Now, is there any difference? Of, is there actually any difference between these two opinions, or is it just a matter of wording? And they apply the yeah. There can be, and there can be differences. There can be difference. And difference is what the uh, man was referring to. Is that in the first case, the first group of scholars they say automatically by its wording it refers to whoever is similar to that case. For example, if someone makes the an. Uh, or accuses his wife of uh, committing adultery, has to make the ayin according to this ruling, automatically applies to him. So here the application to him is what they call nusul al It is qati. Uh, okay. It is the definitive application that that ruling applies to him. There's no doubt about it. It is definitive. So the other people say it is through qiyat. Is qiyat qati or is it bani? It depends on which kind of qiyas. There's more than one kind of qiyas. We didn't get that far. Okay. <laughs> but it is not, uh, if it is dhanni or whatever, uh, dhanni means not, not definitive, it is speculative. There is some doubt about, about it, how uh, strong it is to be, uh, to be applied. So this is where the difference of opinion could come about. Uh, when, when there is maybe a conflict between how to apply a verse. If, for example, in the, in the first case, if there's a, if there's a verse that has a specific uh, revelation behind it, and a similar situation comes up, according to the first group, it is to be applied immediately to that situation. According to the second group, it is applied to Qiyas. Suppose you have, for example, the verse should be applied, but one scholar says, okay, it is applied only through Qiyas, but in this case, Maslaha says not to apply. Maslaha means, uh, what, how would you translate Maslaha? Interest. Public utility. Public interest. I guess. Maslaha. Do you have the same word in English? Alhamdulillah. <laughs> good. Good. So I don't have to worry about whether the translation is good or not. <laughs> so in that case, what to do? Someone could argue that applying this particular verse 
to this new occasion, okay, even though the new occasion is the same as the original occasion, pretty much, goes against Muslaha. Well, he might put Muslaha before Qiyas. If he does that, then he will not apply that verse. Is this acceptable? In some Mabahabis? Yes. But no, mostly. No, mostly. Uh, <laughs> 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 so, so you could have that problem. So there is actually a difference between these two opinions. Like I said, the strongest opinion uh, is the first opinion, especially since that was the opinion of all of the Sahaba. There was actually a jma'ah of the Sahaba, and that jma'ah is fairly well, fairly well confirmed, and there's no, re- no need to uh, go against that jma'ah. But I think those narrations from Malik and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, as in many other cases, they may not be uh, understood, they were interpreted uh, incorrectly. So based on something that happened in, uh, in, er- in an earlier lecture, about some confusion between how to now exactly apply Asbab al-Nuzul and how to use it uh, in Tafsir. We have to realize that what Asbab al-Nuzul gives us exactly in Tafsir is it, it specifies the exact meaning of the verse. Asbab al-Nuzul can specify the exact meaning of the verse but it doesn't specify the application of the verse catch that point okay, it specifies the exact meaning of the verse but doesn't specify the application for example I'll give you a clear example but uh, uh, then I'll give one which is I guess less clear because as I said it was brought up uh, earlier the verse we talked about earlier لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمَنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاهَمْ فِيمَا تَعَيْمُوا that there shall be no sin imputed upon those who believe and do good works for what they have eaten the verse, uh, as I said, no one can ignore the Asbab al Nuzul. No one can look at that verse and ignore the Asbab al Nuzul and say, now it's okay for anyone to eat whatever he wants. The Asbab al Nuzul specifies the meaning of the verse, what is meant by what they eat here, or what they have eaten. It means that something was halal before, it was made haram, and now they can no longer eat it, but if they ate it while it was halal, there's no sin upon it. So it specifies what the meaning of the verse is. But it doesn't specify the application. In other words, for example, nowadays, if we have a new Muslim, he just became Muslim, and he doesn't know that pork is haram. If he continues to eat pork until he finds out it's haram, then there is no sin upon him for what he ate by the meaning of this verse. The meaning, the application of this verse in general. But if anyone uh, eats anything, and before he knows it's haram, then there's no sin upon him. So it's a dead verse, is, it's very, fairly clear. But let's take another verse which uh, was uh, a source of controversy earlier. This is the verse that says, One took off his sabili la, while I took off the edukum in the Okay? And spend your wealth for the cause of Allah. Not the end here, I guess. One took off his sabili. Anyway. And, and, and do not, and be not cast by your own hands to ruin. This is verse 192 of Surah Al-Baqarah. So stand in the way of Allah and do not destroy yourself by your own hand. That's another way to translate. Stand in the way of Allah and do not destroy yourself by your own hand. So what's the meaning of that verse? This verb in Nuzul again specifies the meaning of the verse. If someone were to go to that verse and say that suicide is haram based on that verse, he's wrong. Because that's not what the verse is saying. What's the meaning of that verse? You remember that Asbab mm-hmm. Nuzul? Okay, what's the meaning of that verse? It was one of the Sahaba after Fatimakta, one of the Sahaba after Fatimakta, some of the Ansar, they went back to their businesses, uh, to their farms and so forth that they had neglected for so many years. And the verse, as Abu Ayyub al Ansari mentioned, he said it was revealed for the Ansar at that time. And it means that if you give up spending in the way of Allah, and if you give up jihad, then you are actually destroying yourselves by your own hand. Okay, that's what the verse means. It doesn't refer to suicide or something like that. Okay. So the Spam and Nuzul uh, specifies the meaning of the verse. But destroying yourself by your own hands here doesn't mean suicide at all. But it means not going out 
for the sake of Allah, not sacrificing for the sake of Allah. When you do not sacrifice, when you're not willing to sacrifice, it is as if you are destroying yourself by your own deed, by your own hand. Okay? So it specifies the meaning, but it doesn't specify the application. In other words, that wasn't just true for the Ansar, but it's true for any Muslim until the Day of Judgment. That when they do not go, or when they're not willing to make jihad, when they're not willing to spend in the way of Allah and sacrifice in the way of Allah, then they are destroying themselves by their own hands. So the meaning of the verse is specified by this Qabun Nizur, but the application is not. Does that make sense? Right. The point is that this Qabun Nizur gives us the exact meaning of the verse. And we cannot uh, go away from that meaning. No. No. You know, some people get confused on that point and they think sometimes they, they forget the fact that the Asbab of Nuzul specifies the meaning and secondly sometimes they think then it just refers to for example the Ansar no and it specifies the meaning but the application again is to anyone uh, in the similar circumstances just to give now one example of uh, the importance of Asbab of Nuzul and how it and as I said we gave earlier examples but this is now uh, an example in which the difference of opinion based on this example still exists until today. And that is that if, if a Muslim slaughters an animal, but he doesn't mention the name of Allah. He makes tabiha, but he doesn't mention the name of Allah. Either intentionally or out of forgetfulness. It doesn't matter. Is it halal to eat that meat, that animal that he slaughtered? And now I'll judge you according to the method that you're supposed to, <laughs> that you claim to belong to. <laughs> you know that he didn't mention it, and he didn't mention it either out of forgetfulness or unintentionally or intentionally, it doesn't matter. Is that meat halal or not? <laughs> well, when you give an answer, you should give your proof. Ahnaf, according to Abu Hanif and others, it is not permissible to eat that meat. And their opinion is based on what verse of the Quran? Yeah. Right. The the proof for that uh, opinion is from uh, Surah uh, Al Maidah. Al 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 Naam. Verse one twenty one. It says, "And eat not of that Quran. Allah's name has not been mentioned, for lo, it is abomination." So the verse continues and says what? <laughs> Allah, the devils do inspire their uh, minions to dispute with you. But if you obey them, you will be in truth uh, idolaters. <laughs> yeah. Is that good proof? Imam <laughs> Shafi <laughs> says, no. Imam Shafi says you may eat the meat slaughtered by a Muslim whether or not he mentions the name of Allah on it or not. Right? Well, you don't apply that anymore. <laughs> According to Imam Shafi, Imam Shafi rejects this argument. He rejects this proof. What's his proof to reject this proof? That's mine, you just... <laughs> okay, he, he rejects this proof based on the Aqtaban Azul. Okay. What is the Asbab and of this verse? According to Ibn Abbas and other Sahaba, what's the Asbab and of this verse? Why was this verse revealed? So, this verse was revealed when the Kufar, as the verse refers to, the Kufar, and as inspired by the uh, Shayateen, asked the believers. Why do you eat what Allah, what you have slaughtered, but you do not eat uh, what Allah has slaughtered? Why do you eat what you have slaughtered, but you do not eat what Allah has slaughtered? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what do they mean by that? The meat. The meat. Okay. They are saying that the, the animal that dies by itself, you don't eat it. 
But Allah slaughtered it. While you will eat the one that you slaughtered. Okay, this was very And this is according to Imam Jafi, this is what is meant in this verse by the animal, Lam Yuthkara Ismallahi Ali. This is what is meant in the verse by the animal where Allah is not Allah's name has not been mentioned over. So he's saying based on this Bab Nazul that it's not a general thing here, meaning any animal that Allah's name hasn't been mentioned. But it's just the dead meat, the animal that dies by itself. If they if they slaughter uh, what do you mean? They slaughter also a sheep. Hey, if they slaughter by themselves then uh, according to Shah they do not make. Hey, but there's other proofs that that meat isn't halal. Yeah, but he's saying that if a Muslim slaughters remember that was the original question. <coughs> if a Muslim slaughters and doesn't mention the name of Allah over the animal, he also talks about anyone who is Muslim, he will not slaughter for the sake of the Lafnam or something like that. He'll not slaughter it in the name of idols or something like that. He also makes an argument. I mean, it is, uh, it's is—it's more than just this point. But the point is that based on the Islam of Nazul, he's saying that what is meant here by the animal which hasn't had the name of Allah mentioned over it, it's not general. It doesn't mean any animal in which Allah's name hasn't been mentioned over it. But it, mean, it means specifically to the carrion or the nata that died by itself. And his proof for that is in the Islam of Nazul. Are you? <laughs> could be animals that by itself could be Muslim slaughtering it without mentioning Allah's name. Could be, for example, mushrik slaughtering it without mentioning Allah's name. There's other proof that the mushrik you cannot eat it whether he, sl- he mentioned Allah's name or whatever. Okay, so there's other proof for that. So we're left with these two: a Muslim not mentioning the name of Allah, or and or it being just dead meat that died. Uh, through natural causes. Right? That, that is the meaning of the verse. If you just think about it, it just says what Allah's name hasn't been mentioned over. That's if you don't take into consideration the Asbab and Nazul. If you take into consideration the Asbab and Nazul, that they're talking about Meta, this is all they're talking about, that animal that was died, that died by itself, or as they said, the animal that Allah slaughtered. And then this verse was revealed, it means that the animal that was not slaughtered, that had, that didn't have the name of Allah mentioned over it, the meaning of that is not general, as a Muslim, for example, slaughters and doesn't mention it, but the meaning is only a meat. Do you know? So because of the use of the Sbab and Zul, it leads to this difference of opinion uh, in, uh, in Taq. Well, I will not go into a discussion of which uh, opinion seems to be stronger. I just brought that example. As another example to show how important Asbab and Nuzul is uh, and how it can affect the uh, interpretation of the Quran. So with respect to Asbab and Nuzul and what rank it has, for example, with respect to the other sources we talked about and how much weight should be given to the Asbab and Nuzul. So if a Sahabi, if one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad specifically narrates that such and such is the Asbab and Nuzul of a verse and we discussed by the way last time uh, the different terms that the Sahabi might use some mean that it's Asbab and Nuzul some doesn't, don't mean that um, if the Sahabi specifically mentioned the Asbab and Nuzul then that statement is considered marfor. what's the meaning of marfor? it means it's coming as if it's coming from the problem Muhammad has the same rank as if it's coming from the Prophet Muhammad Because in fact they are describing like describing the action of the Prophet. Sahabi describes it. It is metaphor. It is coming from the Prophet Muhammad Same thing with respect to Asbab and Nuzul. Therefore it cannot be overridden by Ijtihad. In other words, Asbab and Nuzul has to take preference over Ijtihad. Like in the verse, وَلَا تُلْقُ بِيَيْدُكُمْ إِلَا تَحْلِكَ Do not destroy yourself by your own hands. The Asbab and Nuzul clearly show us that it is referring to leaving the jihad and not giving for the sake of Allah no one can come later and say for example it means a kind of suicide or anything of that nature hence Asbab al-Nazul is one of the important sources of Tafsir and we must consult it when we wish to uh, determine the correct and the exact meaning of uh, of any verse yeah 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 uh, before we move on, let me just uh, mention some of the sources for, for this Babin Nuzul. 
And besides, of course, the different books of hadith, in some of the tafsir, there's been some books written uh, just about Asbab Nuzul itself. Some books that are, and it's just collections of Asbab Nuzul, the hadith which mentioned Asbab Nuzul. One of them is by, uh, it's, all, it's called Asbab Nuzul, and it's by Al Wahidi. Al Wahidi? Al Wahidi. Al Wahidi. Well, another one uh, is by a Suyuti. What's the name of his book? His book is Al Lubab al Nukul fi Askam al Nuzul. Well, in his introduction to his book, a Suyuti says his book is much better than Al Wahidi's book. And he gives, uh, he gives the reasons why. But that's not abnormal, but, uh, abnormal for a Suyuti. He says that about many of his books. One time he wrote a book on the same topic with uh, another scholar. He had a little competition with another scholar during his time called uh, Sakhawa. Well, they both wrote a book, I think it was about Ulum uh, al Hadith. Well, he was comparing his book to uh, Sakhawa's book, and he said, My book compared to his is like the sun compared to uh, the light of a small star. <laughs> Anyway, he says that his book is better for uh, following reasons. He includes some narrations that al Wahidi did not mention. He, he ascribes every hadith to its relevant uh, books, while sometimes al Wahidi will not even mention his source. He distinguished between the authentic and weak narrations. He combined different narrations for extra information and benefits. And he excluded those things that are not actually as Muslim material. We talked about those uh, kind of things last time. Well, now? For this reason, correct. Yeah. Well, this book, uh, this is a Tafsir al Jalalain from, uh, this is from the mosque, it belongs to the mosque, although it's been with me for some time. <laughs> I will turn it to the mosque tonight. Along the margin of the book, uh, in the margin of the Hamish, here, this is the book that I'm describing right now. This is a Suyuti's Aspen Mazur. Book on Aspen Mazur. Oh, Suyuti's there. Yeah. So it is here, in the margin here. Right. So if you want to know the Asbab al Nuzul of any verse uh, that the Suyuti mentions in his book, you can find it here. And there might even be an index. Yes, there's even an index for the surahs of uh, a Suyuti's Asbab al Nuzul. Well, there's an even, uh, there's an even uh, probably a better work on Asbab al Nuzul, more recent work. It's called Al Sahih al Musnad min Asbab al Nuzul. Sahih al Musnad min Asbab al Nuzul. There's no Sajjah. At least in a Sufi title, see Sajjah. But this one does. This is by Muqbil bin Hadi al Wadi. And what makes this book superior to a Sufi's book is that unfortunately a Sufi, when it comes to grading hadith, is not very strict. And he calls many hadith, for example, Hassan, when they are not actually Hassan. He's not very strict. Uh, Mukbul's book is much better in that sense. Hmm? Yeah. 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 <coughs> Any questions about the seven Azul before we move on to the uh, to the next topic, which isn't too and it is fairly close to the seven Azul. Yeah. No? Okay. Yeah, and the and the first lecture on the seven Azul. We mentioned that the verses of the Quran are two types. One that have a sbab, clear a sbab, and others that do not have. Okay. Those that do not have clear a sbab, we're talking about how do we get the meaning of those, then we refer also to the other sources of Tafsir that we talked about, the Quran, the Sunnah, the Hadith, the Prophet, the did he explain the meaning of those verses, uh, the Arabic language, the Sunnah, the Sahaba, and so forth. And it's not, it's not necessary for it, for any verse to have a sbab in the in order for us to understand its meaning. But it helps a lot. <laughs> yeah. Any other question? So let's take, by the way, one, uh, since this book is here, let's take one example of a spell in the world from uh, Theotis' book. Surat uh, Al Imran, verse 113, which talks about, uh, and again, as I said, uh, Looking at this Baba Zul many times will give us uh, different meaning for the verse. Many people 
misunderstand verses because they don't look at the rest of the Mizzou. The, the verse in uh, Al Imran says, Sawa an min ahli kitabi ummatun qaymatun yatlununa ayati allahi an ana al-layli wa hum yasjudun. Uh, I give a translation of that. <laughs> that, the, the, that not all of them are the same from the people of the book. There are some people who, uh, who act by the, the uh, who act and recite the, uh, the verses of Allah uh, during the night and they prostrate, uh, they serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Spanish Muslim, this verse is talking about whom? Some people take it as talking about Christians nowadays. They take this verse and they say, no, not all Christians are the same. There's some people from Ahl Kitab, some Christians and Jews, that make this verse. They say, I mean, they recite the words of Allah, in other words, the Bible, and they worship Allah and they serve Allah and so forth. Yes. But who, who is this verse referring to? If you read that's better in the world, it became Muslim. Okay. If you, see, if, you, if you look, for example, in uh, Tiyoti's book, and it's about Muzul, it's about Muzul of this verse, uh, as he says, with Ibn Abu Hatim and Atabarani and Ibn Mundah record <coughs> from, uh, from Ibn Abbas and actually from others, it is referring to the, Mus- to the people of Ahl al-Kitab who embrace this stuff. Whether they are Jews or Christians. Including Abdullah bin Salam, uh, and he mentions verses about six or so. Mm-hmm. There is another verse that Allah people argue about. Yeah, that's, that's a different topic. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> no. Inshallah. <laughs> any, any question about this Islam in Israel from, from this time or from uh, two months ago? It's just lingering in your mind for these past two months. <laughs> so, there's some other, uh, we can call them sources of this here, I guess. Uh, but, they are similar, but they are different from Islam and Muslim. But they also, they also needed to really get an understanding of some particular verses in the Qur'an. For example, one thing that we should uh, be familiar with to understand many verses of the Qur'an is the customs of the Arabs uh, during the time of Jahili. Okay. So this is another, we can call it a source of this here not maybe the best way to call the source of Tafsir, but... Uh, the topic is Anas al-Jahili. Uh, yeah, they call it as another source of Tafsir, after as well in Israel, and the customs of the people of Jahili. Okay. It's important that we are familiar with, with their customs, especially some of their customs, in order to understand completely uh, many verses of the Qur'an. Okay. Yeah. So, as I mentioned, uh, many of, many, there's many references in the Quran to many of the practices of uh, Jahiliyyah. It's not exactly the same thing as the Spam and Nazir, but if we're familiar with those practices during the times of Jahiliyyah, we'll understand uh, the verses better, at least in uh, more detail. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about. Uh, and entering the houses, entering houses from, from behind, instead of from the front, is, uh, after you make Hajj. Okay. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about it? Yeah. 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 Okay, before that. Yeah. Now, local dirt, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's not piety that you enter your houses from behind them. Okay. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refer to in this case? Not the same thing as the study of Jesus, it wasn't that something occurred, and so therefore this verse uh, was revealed, but it was referring to a practice during the time of Jahili. Unexpected? Hmm? Unexpected. Yeah, yeah, there was a practice in the time of Jahili, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this practice is not correct. What's it referring to? What's the verse referring to? Who must know what the verse is referring to? You know the verse, you don't know what it's referring to. This is the... Uh, <laughs> and you should, if you read the verse, the verse, you should ask yourself, what is this talking about? Say it all. Say it all. Say it all. And he said, What is it going to happen? Yeah. Say it all. Say it all. Say it all. Say it all. 
في البيجيني يعني ليلي سيدي سابق نعم يعني يقول توز بليس من جهه اليد افتر يو ميك ذا حج وين يو جو هوم يو شود انتر يور هاوس فروم بيهايند يعني ذات از اولموست لايك ان اسبكت اوف ذا حج وين يو جو هوم يو شود انتر يور هاوس فروم بيهايند This was a practice during Jahiliyyah. Okay. If we are not familiar with that practice during Jahiliyyah, we'll read the verse like apparently some of you do, <laughs> without knowing what it's, uh, what it's referring to. Outside? Outside. Okay.